The Zinger 21C is a largely 3D printed hypercar that's been generating a lot of buzz lately after smashing the Laguna Seca record. However, something that most people seem to overlook is the highly effective aerodynamic layout of the car. In this video, we're going to discuss the aerodynamics of the car, why this layout is aerodynamically superior, and then go through a practical example of showing its superiority. To start off with, as always, let's talk some quick numbers. Now, the downforce figures claimed for this car are quite high. We've got 640 kilos at 100 miles an hour and about 2,500 kilos at 200 miles an hour, which interesting mix of metric and imperial units aside, works out to be around an SCZ of 5.1. This is quite a high value, but given some of the details on this car, such as the large splitter, the overall aerodynamic layout, and the relatively low ride heights and track configuration, I'm inclined to say it's quite a believable number. In the video of the lap record around Laguna Seca, they talk a bit about an efficiency of 3.5 to 1. Now, using that SCZ of 5.1, that gives an SCX or a CDA of about 1.7, which is a little bit higher than I actually expected, and I thought the efficiency would be a bit better giving the styling. But maybe the, the SCZ figure is actually a peak downforce in a certain condition, actual downforce uh, across the, the map might be a bit lower, around 4.5, and then that gives an SCX of 1.3, which is a little bit closer to what I would expect. But we've probably got a ballpark SCX somewhere in that range, and again, these are quite reasonable numbers. They're, they're nothing too far away from what I was expecting. I, I don't think that they'd be just faking marketing numbers. So all in all, numbers are believable, but they're also high. They're good, solid performance numbers. And we need to talk a little bit about the aerodynamics on the car to discuss why this is the case. As with pretty much all road-going cars, uh, there's a lot of, of interesting aerodynamic details, but there's also a few bits of styling going on. Overall, I think they've got the balance done pretty well in terms of it seems to largely be based uh, around aerodynamic performance more so than just styling, but keep in mind there are always going to be a few styling details on a car like this. So the crux of this video is to discuss the advantages of the particular aerodynamic layout on this car. Now, when I'm referring to that, what I'm talking about is it's fairly unconventional seating layout compared to a normal two-seater supercar or hypercar. Now, the key thing is to compare it to other two-seaters because this is, of course, a two-seater and most cars in this class are two-seaters. Uh, and the advantage that this particular car has over a conventional side-by-side -side seating arrangement is that it has the driver's seat sitting around here and then the passenger seat behind it here. Now this gives us quite a, a lot more design freedom aerodynamically because it means we have a narrower center cockpit that resembles more of a single seater setup. And I'll talk a little bit more through some of the aerodynamic benefits and also some of the, the packaging constraints around this setup a little bit later on in the video. For now though, I'm gonna talk a bit more about the aerodynamic detailing around the car before I get into the layout specific discussion. Now there's quite a few neat little aerodynamic details on this car that aren't obvious when you first look at it, in addition to some more conventional details. So to start off with the conventional details, we've got some standard sort of dive planes at the front here. So they're gonna generate some local downforce at the front and help manage the, the tire wake as their vortices get cast along the side of the car. We also have a stepped front splitter uh, which I've talked about in a few other videos and won't cover too much more, but basically that can help with getting mass flow uh, to under the floor and it can also help with pitch sensitivity on the car. And then at the back, we've got a dual element rear wing. Now, let's talk about some of the more subtle details because there's actually some really neat tricks going on in this car that aren't really obvious. First one is dual element rear wing, you'll see actually has a raised center section. Now, if you have a look at the car, you'll notice that we've got a downwashing center deck around here. We don't have much downwashing at the side though. We're pretty much flat at the side portion out here. So we change uh, our profile of our wing as we move across the span and that aligns really nicely there. Another neat little detail in the rear wing is that we have these slots cut through the blend around into the main wing. Now this will help with any end plate induced separations on the elements and will also help extract the air in all directions in a three dimensional sense as there'll be some side wash on the rear wing. And if you have a look at the rear wing, it's actually curved in profile. This leading edge sweeps forward. I'm gonna capture the sort of side flow that's going out towards the tips, which should make for quite an efficient and powerful rear wing. Some other subtle detailing is that we have a little uh, block off plate here in front of the rear wheel. We're gonna encourage outwash out there. We're gonna generate local load from pressure on the top of the side skirt. And we're also gonna help with any extraction in front of the front tire. So we're gonna get some good load and good performance out of this region here. Another neat little detail is, is that we have these little buttresses here. So we actually have through flow through this area that goes through, flows over the top and kicks out the back. 
And this particular through flow is going to help by powering up essentially a, a beam wing style structure here, which could help with rear end extraction and diffuser extraction. At the front, we have this big cutout behind the rear tire to help vent the air out the sides. And we also have an angled leading edge that will help spool up a bit of a vortex on its leading edge, manage that front tire wake a bit better, uh, and also generate a little bit of suction along the floor leading edge. In terms of cooling management, you can see that we've got uh, some big air intakes at the back that are gonna feed presumably some coolers in the rear. And we also have the engine air intake sitting up the top. Moving around to the rear of the car, we can see that we've got a big old cooling outlet at the back of the car above here in between the diffuser and the top deck. And you can also see that buttress bypass exit here where that beam wing is sort of disguised. So airflow in there, along here, and then out the back there with a bit of a kick on it. So we have a beam wing style system. Some more nice detail is also visible here where you can see just here that we actually have a curved foot plate up in here. So this profile is looping like this, which means that any sort of edge vortex along there is gonna be captured and housed quite nicely underneath there. Same with the front end. We have another foot plate with a little curve here that's gonna house that front vortex. And there's lots of neat details like this all over the car. It looks fairly simple and plain at a first glance and it looks quite clean, but they've actually done a good job of integrating lots of nifty little aero details. And again, just another shot where you can more clearly see those foot plates housed there and there. Some other neat details around the front end is that if you have a look, you can see that we have this curve in and then kick out for a bit of outwash just ahead of the front tire. And it's actually quite scalloped through here. And that's gonna help get maximum extraction out of the front end and any sort of front diffusers that they have around this splitter. And you can see this cave and scallop is even more apparent in this shot where you can see that cut in through there where we really are caving in and then kicking out. Okay, so we've talked about the aero detailing on the car, but let's talk about this overall layout because this is something that's really quite exciting from an aerodynamic perspective. The first thing you'll notice is that we have a really narrow center pod. And if you have a look at where the driver is there, you can see just how tiny this front bit here is. And so when you consider where the chassis is here versus a conventional car, which would be sitting all the way out here to do a side-by-side -side configuration, you can already see how much smaller the frontal area is of our chassis, how much tighter we are through the center, and therefore how much more room as an aerodynamicist you would have to play with around the sides. Now, keeping this frontal area smaller through the chassis core has several advantages. One, and most obvious, is that by decreasing the frontal area here, you're going to naturally reduce the drag of the car because you have less frontal area through this whole portion here, as well as underneath and through whatever they've got going on underneath this, this hood, uh, there'll be less area behind it. Therefore, you should naturally decrease the drag of the car compared to a wider layout. This also means that you're gonna get less wake region from behind the cabin fed to the rear wing, and that's going to improve rear wing performance in addition to our overall drag save on our car. The next advantage is venting of the front end. And this is something I'm gonna talk about a little bit later in the video with a CFD based example. Essentially though, with most closed cockpit touring style cars, one of the things we really struggle for is front downforce. And if you've got your, your splitter or something running through here, you need to be able to get the air out from the front splitter. So if you're doing any sort of wing setup, any sort of front diffuser setup, you gotta get that air out. And with a wide style two seater cockpit side by side, it's very difficult to do because the cockpit comes out quite wide all the way out to sort of here. And then it's very difficult to get the air out because you've got to have a very sharp cut in and return back to, to your center section. And that makes everything really quite annoying to get a lot of front downforce. What you'll notice is though, is that with this narrow center section, we have a lot of design freedom in terms of this particular sector can be enormous. If you look at how wide that cutout is, you can see that there's tons of venting out from the front end that we can just run straight out that gap there. And we have so much more freedom on what we can do there with the floor leading edge and things like that, that are going to naturally give us a ton more downforce. You can see here in this front end shot of the Zinger with the body overlaid on it, that there's this huge gap from here to the chassis there, massive gap there, We've got a huge amount of freedom that we could do with the splitter in terms of putting a wing element or something like that and hiding that in there, turning it into a front wing and then extracting out there. There's so much we can do 
there's so much space to play with uh, and it's obviously something they're going to be utilizing. And I know it's something they're utilizing because we actually have a look at this front suspension we can see that in comparison to the rest of the suspension on the body, which is generally run through a shape optimizer and has all these funky shapes, they've just run straight aero blades through there. There's nothing fancy that's not a generative shape optimized design or anything like that. So they're just straight cut, which tells me that they are planning to have a lot of airflow through that region there. And they're trying to streamline their wishbones as much as possible and maximize the aerodynamic effects of this whole giant cutout region. Now, while we're looking at it from this angle, it's worth pointing out another advantage of this narrow design, which is where you can put your diffuser tunnels. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that Zinger is using this to the full effect, but if I was using this particular layout, I would be using the fact that you can start your diffuser tunnels very early alongside the car, much like my Peugeot 9x8 concept, and then you can go cut it back, cut it through there, and then you can extract and get a huge amount of diffuser volume coming out through the front, through the sides, and up there. This is something that's really hard to do with a side-by-side -side style car. Of course, nothing comes for free when designing any sort of car, and this layout choice is no different. The first thing to think about is the compromise of length versus width, because you still have to package two people in. So obviously the alternative layouts that you have are that you can go and have either a side-by-side, -side, where you have quite a wide chassis, that goes more or less like this. Uh, and then you have your engine sitting where I've drawn it here, or you have a front back setup where your chassis goes like this, and then it extends a bit longer. And as a result, you'll have to push all your engine further back here. Now this changes your compromise about how you design your diffuser, because obviously with the front back configuration, we can have the, the tunnel start early, like I said, and come further back, like I suggested. Or with the side-by-side -side configuration in red, we couldn't have the tunnel start any further forwards than the start of the chassis, uh, and then they, they can work their way alongside, but they can come in further where the engine is. However, Singer has clearly thought of this and come up with a solution that gets around this in other ways. Whilst their chassis ends up longer overall because of their seating configuration, what they've done is they've actually shrunk the power plant unit's length, which gets around the whole issue of everything being longer. This is an image of the power plant and gearbox used in the Zinger. Now, people with a keen eye will note that that gearbox is running the opposite way compared to a normal transaxle in a normal sort of super or hypercar. Typically speaking, it's common practice to have your, your engine situated just behind the driver's cell at the front, and then you'll run your clutch as is situated here, and then you'll have a transaxle running along. So you'll have your main gear stacks running along the car, and then you'll have a ring and pinion style drive that will then turn the transmission sideways, uh, either at the front or the back, depending on your gearbox style. But you'll notice that in the Zinger, all the gear stack is running laterally. Now what this means is that that can actually result in a more compact gearbox in a length sense, even if it's a little bit wider a gearbox. The net result of that is actually when you look at the back of the car, the whole powertrain element is incredibly short and stubby. It's not very long at all. And that means that the overall chassis length isn't that long. So you can still actually package in a reasonable diffuser. So long as you're not trying to expand in this particular region here, which really isn't that long, so that's the overall layout, and they've done a very nice job on this, and it's really refreshing to see a different concept that also looks really functional, and judging by the lap times, seems to work quite well. But let's go through, as promised, a practical demonstration of how this layout can be quite handy. So basically, what I've done is I've taken my CAD from my 9x8 video, or with its standard front chassis, which is designed to more or less fit two people in it, but at a pinch, probably one and a half people, and then what I've done is I've gone and narrowed it down so that it's more like a sort of single seater style chassis, just to show you what the benefits are of just going to this narrower chassis style. I haven't changed anything else. I haven't re-optimized anything else. So the flows down the rest of the car are gonna be pretty rubbish. But by narrowing this nose, I'm really hoping that we'll be able to let the car breathe much better around the front end and improve performance on the front splitter. So let's have a look at the results from that. So as you can see, these are my two 9x8s. On the left-hand side, we have the, the narrow-nosed concept, and on the right-hand side, we have the wide concept. So you can see that the primary difference between the two is just the width of the nose, and obviously some minor changes to accommodate for that. 
but no optimizations from that point downwards. And let's have a look at the downforce on the front splitter. If you have a look at the suction underneath on the splitter, what you can see is that the suction on the front splitter of the narrow nose concept is significantly higher than the suction on the underside of the wide nose concept. And overall, this actually results in a front downforce increase of 17% on the narrow nose concept, despite the fact that when I went to this narrow nose concept, I screwed up a lot of my more optimized flows from before and hurt the downstream flow effect, so I lost suction on the center floor. On top of that, by going to this narrower nose design, I massively decreased the pressure drag on the front nose of my chassis, to the point where the overall car drag went down by 9%. This is all just doing this nose change. I didn't change any of the other geometry on the car. Imagine if I was able to pair that with larger diffuser tunnels further down the car as a result of the narrower chassis. I would have a car with significantly more downforce and a reduced overall drag level. And while the Singer isn't quite using this to the same level that I am with respect to the fact that obviously they need bumpers for crash safety and all these other things going on, they're definitely making use of some of this advantage. And in my opinion, this is what makes it a superior overall aerodynamic layout to the conventional two-seater aerodynamic layout. So that's all for this analysis. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that like button and leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me. Hit the subscribe button to see more from my channel and hopefully I'll see you next time.